Thank you for being a part of today's study in the book of James. We're in chapter 1 and we're going to start reading with verse 5. It, James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Wisdom is the overarching theme of the book of James. People who read this book and apply it to their lives will be led by the wisdom from above, which is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That's James chapter 3, verse 17. James doesn't define wisdom. Instead, he counsels us to live by the wisdom from above, instead of wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And again, that's James chapter 3, verse 15. The book of Proverbs deals with the wisdom of our Jewish heritage. We can discover various qualities of wisdom by reading this rich book in the Bible. Chapter 2 of Proverbs does not exhaust the characteristics of wisdom. However, when you combine the list of Proverbs with that in James chapter 3, verse 17, you have a good idea of how a truly wise person will act. Let's look at the one from Proverbs. Wisdom treasures God's commandments. Wisdom inclines the inner self to understanding. The wise person understands what it means to fear the Lord. Wisdom embraces righteousness, justice, equity, and every good path. Wisdom delivers people from the way of evil and from perverted speech. Wisdom will keep a person from evil. Now when you look at the list from Proverbs, or the one from James chapter 3, uh, wouldn't you like to work for someone who has character traits like those? Wouldn't you like your car salesman to be wise, like we've just described? But more importantly, don't you want to be someone with a James 3, 17, or Proverbs kind of wisdom? Over the years, I have been inspired by several great Christian leaders, particularly from the last century. I discovered reading just this last week that two of them were highly regarded by the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. So if you've read some of the early AA literature, you may have run across the names of E. Stanley Jones and Glenn Clark. They are two of my spiritual friends, even though they died before I ever got interested in Jesus. Glenn Clark is an interesting man. He was a track and football coach, a college professor, a writer of all sorts of books, a book publisher, a summer camp organizer, a counselor and confidant to many. He was a man who believed in God's creative power from which flowed the fruits of the Spirit. He was a man who practiced prayer as the most creative means of contacting and communicating with God. So he was a gifted student. He graduated from Harvard with an advanced degree. But at age 30, he read something that turned him away from his faith, and he declared himself an atheist. And for almost 10 years, Clark existed on the wisdom that James describes as earthly. He found himself one day traveling from Minnesota to Illinois, and he met an old whitehead guy who was unusual, a little strange. He spoke somewhat cryptically, and they struck up a conversation that eventually led Clark back to a vibrant faith in Jesus. A little side note on this, Clark really didn't know anything about the man other than what he'd said to him on the train until one day he was checking the furnace in his basement. His furnace was a popular model. It provided heat to thousands of homes in the country. Well, the man on the train was the owner of that furnace company. He did a little more research and found out he also was a Sunday school teacher of the largest men's class in the whole country. Well, Clark lived two miles from the college where he was a professor, and he walked to and from school every day, and he started using the time to be receptive to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was able to transform his wisdom from earthly to wisdom that comes from above. So I've listed a couple of, of his thoughts that give you an idea of his wisdom. There was a time when he was watching a small child dig a well in the sand by a seashore, and he thought, 
that just as the seven seas are stirred to fill the little well this child is dug in the sand, so all of heaven is stirred from its heights to its depths to fill the heart that truly hungers after God. In the time it took Clark to walk two miles from school and return home, he opened his inner life so God could fill it with his spirit. Now the question for us is, what can we do so that God can fill us with his spirit? Is there a prayer walk we need to be taking or some other activity so this can be done in our lives? Another piece of his wisdom. He said, let us not look at the negatives that lead us into temptation, but let us look at the positives that lead us away from evil. We should give ourselves so utterly to the task of filling ourselves with a living Christ that there will be no room henceforth for that which is unlike Christ ever to enter again. Well, we know that temptation and sin obviously fills our mind with earthly, unspiritual, and demonic thoughts. From these thoughts come jealousy and selfish motives, disorder, and every vile practice. That's what James says in chapter 3. Clark's method is not to focus on the temptation, but on being so full of the living Christ that there is no room for unlike Christ things to enter. This is great wisdom for us, provided we act on it. A third thought from Clark, he says, God is your silent partner. Sometimes you'll find yourself in danger of thinking you're the entire firm. Never forget it. He organized it. He capitalized it. He is capable of directing it. The articles of incorporation are set forth in the Bible. Now, this is the way that Glenn Clark described the surrender of his life that we just talked about. He said, I dreamed 18 years ago of taking Jesus completely at his word and placing all the desires of my heart in his hand and letting him bring them to pass in his own way and in his own time. May we do the same. This is from a book called Soul's Sincere Desire by Glenn Clark. Now tomorrow we're going to examine wisdom concerning prayer and faith as James teaches it again in verses 5 through 8. But I'd like to talk for a moment about God's generosity. After all, it is God's abundant generosity that encourages us to pray and trust our lives to him. James encourages us to ask. He says, ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. Again, that's verse 5. So let's just think for a moment about God's generosity. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but not for himself. Everything was created and given to humankind. I think it was Bernard of Clairvaux who said, God first created me so I could live. Then he gave the life of his only son so I could live forever. That is generosity to the fullest. In another place, Paul praised God for his generosity and he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's Ephesians 1, chapter, 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Notice this. God is so generous that he has given people like you and me every spiritual blessing that there is to give. That's amazing. And then God has been thanked for his generosity for people for centuries using the words of Psalm 103. And I'd like to, as we close, turn these words into a prayer. And I'd ask you to do so when you get a chance. Lord, we bless you today. Our souls bless you. All that is within us, we bless your holy name. We bless you because we forget none of your benefits, your generosity. You have forgiven all of our iniquity. You've healed all of our diseases. You have redeemed our life from the pit, and you've crowned us with steadfast love and mercy. You satisfy us with good, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, we thank you and we bless you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being a part of this. And I just uh, look forward to having this presentation with you again tomorrow. God bless you lots.